On today's episode of the podcast, we've asked our guest, editor Tracy Detlefs, to share the five films from 1993 that he thinks are worth a 2020 nomination this year for Best Editing. For the past 20 years, Tracy has worked in almost every aspect of production, post-production, up and down the West Coast. Tracy has been involved in creating commercials, films, television series for MTV, PBS, Comedy Central, and the BBC, the coveted BBC. He has worked with a range of uh, talented folks, but probably his favorite was Weird Al Yankovic, who also slept on his couch while they did a marathon edit of a music video. Tracy's also a registered minister and is available for weddings. Oh, yeah. that's a fun fact. Yeah. yeah. Fifteen weddings to date. Fifteen? Fifteen. Nice. Yeah. You get a free one at sixteen, don't you? I know. Yeah. I know. It's sweet sixteen. Yeah. Uh, Tracy, so uh, we're still trying to get you into the 2020 voting syndicate. Yes, I'm working on that as well. And and we hope. Well, you're not in it. He's not, not in, in it. it but uh, I think I'm this not. year I might be with this. I this, hope so because yeah, because yeah. because we we love having you around and I and, love and, being and here. it's frustrating to to not get you actually in. Uh, so anyway, but even though you know you're not a member, we are, are are very curious to hear what are the five films that you would nominate from '93 for best editing. Well, I don't know if these. I would say that they are. They're probably not going to be the uh, um, uh, the five that end up um, uh, winning because there's only one that's uh, that was uh, nominated and won for that year, which was Schindler's List. Uh, but I also liked uh, Fearless by Peter Weir. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked The War Room, uh, the documentary The War Room, uh, Thirty Two Short Films by Glenn Gould, and um, Groundhog's Day. Yeah, great list. Yeah. Um, You know, it's funny. I think that uh, a lot of times the best editing awards tend to go to the movies with the most cuts. Exactly. And uh, and and here we've actually got uh, we've got no action films on this list, Mm -hmm. and uh, we've got everything from a documentary to a comedy Mm -hmm. to sort of an experimental film, even and uh, and 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 one that actually clocks in at three hours. Yeah. So first up is the experimental film. 32 short films about Glenn Gould. It's a collection of vignettes highlighting different aspects of the, of the life, work, and character of the acclaimed Canadian classical pianist. The editor is Gaston Hult. I'm sorry, did you say it one more time? Because <laughs> I can see how much you struggled with that. <laughs> yeah, I, everybody on this show keeps picking Frenchmen, and I, I have no, no oui. experience speaking French. So We need to get a French uh, sponsor or something. Yeah. yeah. Rosetta Stone, maybe. We can talk to them. Yeah. You can learn French, and then you can do the... Right. Oh, that's a great oh, idea. Do the promos yeah. in French. Yeah. We can do a whole French version of the podcast. Well, oh, perhaps they're France. Yeah. As long as you don't have to talk about Jerry Lewis, it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Légion of Honor. <laughs> so uh, what is it about this movie that... that, that- well, I, I had not uh, heard of Glenn Gould before this. I'm not a real big you know classical guy, but, um, but in the process of, of seeing this film, um, it really... Uh, what a very compelling character. What an interesting life he had. He's almost like a, uh, uh, he was a child prodigy, but also, um, you know, a gifted, gifted pianist. But he also was almost sort of Howard Hughes-like in um, becoming uh, very germaphobic. And, um, uh, and he stopped performing uh, concerts at 32. And he had a, um, he had an interesting uh, take on what the artist and audience relationship was. And that uh, when the artist is uh, up there performing and it's one um, performing for, you know, thousands or something, you know, it, he, he just felt like that was an equation that just didn't make sense to him. You know, he, he thought it should be um, more of a one-to-one thing and, mm. and that when you, you know, just do recordings, you can have that type of experience. And uh, so the film is, uh, he, also, he also did, uh, he was very much into um, you know experimental um, radio recordings and and um, and he uh, I think this is why this was a perfect film for him to do a film in this structure which does cover his entire life but not in a you know uh, not in a uh, timeline that you know it, it doesn't start from you know his um, uh, not a chronological is the right. word I was looking for. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I was thinking that. Thank I you. You're, so. you're pat, you're, I yeah. got the ESPN yeah. they were giving me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the sports The program. ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Lakers are up on the wall. That's great. Right. Um, so um, <laughs> the film starts. Uh, it, it, it's very much a Canadian film. He's very much a Canadian um, artist. And it starts with him 
um, uh, this very, very long shot of the frozen tundra, you know, of, of North Canada, and you just see this speck um, just moving towards the camera um, on this white plain of snow, and um, and there's this nice sort of classical music, and it's just you know he just he's just advancing in the frame, and he maybe even gets sort of midway until you know that's that's the end of that shot. You're going, all right, this is interesting, but then you get okay. He came forth on the frozen tundra kind of mm-hmm. thing, you know. But um, then, you know, you get a little bit of sense of his, how his mother, you know, his mother was very supportive, very, I want to say Svengali-ish, but, you know, that, that, you know, she was playing piano every day while he was in the womb because she wanted him to have a head start, you know. And he was, by the time he was uh, eight, um, you know, was able to play all the Bach um, concertos, all those, you know. So he was, he was really, you know, pushed by his parents, um, and uh, and then the film, you know, starts going off the, the chronological order, and um, you, you know, there's a just these, just you know, there's some animation, there's all the things, but um, there's two that really stick out to me. One is where um, there's a there's a script that he wrote where it's basically him being interviewed and um the the guy who's interviewing him is is giving him a very traditional line of questioning about you know let's talk about your music and he goes i want to talk about anything but my music because that's where the interesting thing comes out if you talk to me about you know um you know uh uh, ecuador um and and uh, indians and stuff like that you know it's like so so he um he just had a very he had a very complicated uh, relationship with um, with being an artist and being an, um, being sort of idolized. Um, and then there's a scene that one of probably my favorites is a, a episode called Hamburg, where he's uh, Hamburg. I don't know. It's the German you know town where yeah. he he is um, he's in a hotel room and um, there's a maid cleaning his room um, and he gets a, a special delivery and. Um, and as the maid is about ready to depart, he he stops her and he has her come over and sit down in a chair. And then um, he pulls out of the special delivery um, a record, puts it on, and starts playing it for her. And the maid is is kind of flummoxed, you know, like this is unorthodox. I'm, I should be leaving. I'm not supposed to be here. And um, but then gradually she just starts getting carried away by this music and. and and gets sort of transported, and she finally, she gets up and she she goes, I've, I've got to see who's who's playing this. And she goes over and she picks up the the record, and it's Glenn Gould, and you know the guy that that whose room she's in, and she just has this realization, oh my God, I'm with this, you know. So, but but it's, it's just this, it's such a unique moment where he just was so much. I want to share this with you, and I want to take you out of what you're doing, and and she had she got what he was trying to do. She had that relationship that he wanted to have with his audience, a very one-to-one communication. Hmm. So it was, it's, it's a really sweet moment. So I haven't seen the film. Is it actually 32 short films? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's, no, it's, it's, and, it's and, fantastic. And, and, and yeah. do they play like, is it really 32 scenes? 32 scenes yeah. where, but then, yeah. then there's one that's like, you know, it's, um, it's called concerto in 45 seconds and, mm-hmm. and it's just basically him in a chair and it's a slow dolly push in on him in the chair and you know there's 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 just these things where it doesn't feel long in any way because you know that it it's a great device because you know that um it is you know this scene's going to be over soon if i don't right. like this device that they're <laughs> right, doing right, right, right. it's going to be over very quickly yeah and is and is each film sort of given its own treatment it's yeah, it's done in a certain way. Yeah. Like it might be an animation, it might be you know, it might be a silent thing, it might be you know, it it's it's they all have a very distinct thing, and and you get the impression afterwards that he would have loved this. He died you know very young, yeah. and um, you get the impression that he just was into sort of subverting whatever the traditional form was. If it had right. just been a um, you know a traditional biopic that you know told his story in a chronological way. Um, I think he would have really felt disappointed. Right. Cool. All right. I uh, I will eventually get around to watching that this year. Yeah. So looking forward to that. You can borrow my copy if you like. Oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's well, nice. I'll that up for That's you. Very nice. Yeah. Oh. Next up is the drama Fearless. Uh, a man's personality is dramatically changed after surviving a major airline crash. The editors of the film were William M. Anderson, Armin Menasian. 
See, again, with the sort of Frenchy kind mm-hmm. of names. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they got it in for you. I don't know how you say this one. Lee Smith. Hmm. Um, so fearless, fearless came up. Uh, fearless came up in another episode of the podcast as 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 Brad Wilkie's one of his five favorite scripts of the year. Awesome, so, good. Uh, what what drew you to this? Well, I will first say that there's a real uh, '90s stink to this film. I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I I you know maybe it's just that U2 soundtrack throughout. Uh, I, I I I understand. <laughs> there's there's also something that you know like. Like, I remember at the time, you know, I like Dead Poets Society now. It so feels so cliche. Like, Peter Weir, you know, is, he's one of those directors who may just be of his era kind mm-hmm. of thing, of a certain era. Um, uh, however, um, I just remember it was one of those films that, you know, like I was saying earlier about, like, like you know, squinting and trying to remember, you know, mm-hmm. like, like, it was one of those films that when I was looking at the list, I remember that stood out as a film that really stuck with me. Yeah. You yeah, know? Uh, and and you know, part of it is I just I love Jeff Bridges. I always have. Um, I think he always brings something. Uh, his characters are always damaged, uh, but it, he brings something special to it. Um, I love that one of the scenes I absolutely love in this film is um, the scene where his very skeevy lawyer uh, Tom Hulse comes in, um, and he is just, oh my God, we are gonna, you know, it's after the plane crash, and and he's just like, we are gonna make a killing. We are just, you know, um, like I'm negotiating with the airline, but I'm also negotiating with the insurance company. We are gonna be rich, you know, and mm-hmm. it's just, it just you know, douchey all over. And he basically brings a gift basket and in that gift basket is some strawberries. Well, Jeff Bridges' character is allergic to strawberries. And he's been just touched with this feeling that, you know, I not only survived that plane crash, but I'm invincible. Yeah. You know, and... And so he's so he just decides to put it to the test while you know he's while Tom Hulse's character is nattering on about how much money they're going to make. You can tell that he's just the Jeff Bridges character is on a different plane, mm-hmm. and and he just grabs one of the strawberries and just you know relishes the bite, and then starts just you know and, and Isabella Rosalini, his wife, just you know sees what he's done and is like, oh my god, call the police! Like and he falls on the floor and and goes into to shock, and. Um, and she starts giving him CPR, and then he starts imagining the plane crash. Mm-hmm. And the plane crash is, I, I love when um, you take something that is is inherently, you, you don't have to ratchet up the, the sound design. You don't have to, you know, go crazy with the effects and all that stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's cut really, really well. But it's also it's set to classical music, and there's no nat sound underneath it, mm-hmm. and it just shows how how at peace he was when um, you realize he's one of those guys that you always hear about, like when the bomb you know when the bomb goes off, he runs towards it while other people right. are running away, yeah. and and so he just has this moment of just kind of like going, I'm uh, I'm I'm okay with this, and and he's even in this in this dream just going like. I can walk to the light, no problem. And it's by that act of walking towards the light that he actually comes back and um, and comes back to life, and then just has this <laughs> grin, like like going, "Yeah, I knew it. I'm just, you know, I, I right. can't be, you know, I'm mortal." You know, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I I just saw that film for the first time this year, mm. and. Uh, it does have a 90s stink on it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being kind of confused by it. I felt like it was kind of mm, sort of all over the place. But yeah. but I wanted to like it. Yeah. But uh, I couldn't quite bring myself to, to get around on it. I, ex- I expect that much from you. I know. I, I know. Yeah. Uh, so next up is uh, the existential comedy Groundhog Day. I thought you were going to say Schindler's List. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, this this, <laughs> this It'll be movie. Give it another twenty years. Yeah. This movie is is is, uh, is coming up roses on everybody's list. Good. Everybody has got this movie on its list. It's about a weather. In case you haven't seen it, I don't know who you are. It's about a weatherman who finds himself living the same day over and over again. And it was edited by somebody who I actually had to look this up because I thought it was a, a nom de plume. Pembroke J. Herring. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> that sounds like Thomas Jane's, you know. Yeah, the, the it was sort of like, yeah. oh, this must be like Harold Ramis's, you know, pseudonym or something. But no, he's he's he's, he's a real guy. Of, yeah, he's mm-hmm. got a bunch of stuff. So, mm-hmm. 
why why Groundhog Day? Well, Groundhog Day is uh, first and foremost. I think that the Academy um, does a very poor job of recognizing comedies. Yeah, uh, I don't think people. I think everybody does. I, I think, think comedy yeah. is just sort of like, oh, it's comedy. Well, that was fun. Moving on. Let's yeah. watch something important now. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Let's let's you know. And and um, it, it to me is um, they are the hardest films to make. And when they are done well, um, man, they just they they deserve much more respect because um, because to pull pull them off and to and to keep the pacing and all this stuff. And this film, you know, this film is great uh, because it works as a comedy. It works, I think, existential comedy is a great way of putting it. But it also uh, works because um, Bill Murray um, is a he when he plays unbearable characters. He's great, and and his you know, and here he's playing a guy who starts off unbearable and then gradually becomes, um, you know, likable uh, likable enough to Andy McDowell's character, mm-hmm. and um, and it's a great editing film because um, there are the same uh, set pieces that have to be done over and over again, and yeah. I think the the one that I love the most is with a very young looking Stephen Toblowski uh, uh, playing Ned, his his annoying um, uh, high school classmate, you know, who's an insurance salesman, and uh, and he comes up and he goes, "Hey, it's Ned! It's Ned! You remember me? Yeah, I remember I did that trick of the talent show with my belly, and you know, something." Like, and it is, and and you see this play out several times until finally and Bill Murray is annoyed every single time he sees him and he, he tries all these things he he tries you know uh, playing along with him he tries punching him and it's when he finally hugs him when the guy comes up he goes Ned and like just and he sort of just caresses his, his head and, right, and, right. and you know it's, it's uh, and, and Ned just goes I gotta go now <laughs> it's this great moment but you know it's it's a, an editor's dream because basically you get to you know first you establish the scene you you set the you set the template and then each time whether it's that alarm going off or whether it's you know him talking to the uh, woman running the bed and breakfast there's all these little moments that that oh we're going to this again let's do a spin on it right you know and and there's some things where you can just set up a joke and just like like you know just just cut it short because the audience knows where it's going. Right. We, we've seen the film once. We've seen the day once. Yeah. So it's a it's a dream for an editor. Yeah, I, I think this I think this thing is going to place very high this year. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. And again, another thing that was a film that was completely overlooked twenty years ago, and I I think it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be a dark horse. Yeah. Well, it's know. one of the very few films that's loved by. You can watch with multiple generations. Yeah, 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 yeah. and it seems like it's totally stands across out. the board. It's yeah. like you mentioned that movie to anybody. It's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Great movie, great yeah. movie. Yeah. Like I've never heard anybody go like, eh, it's not it's funny. Yeah, that's very <laughs> yeah. Speaking of being loved by generations <laughs> and cared for by everyone, <laughs> oh, try again. You know what we keep doing over and over again? Thanking our sponsors. Oh, that's good. That's not bad. I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> that's good. Well, you could, it's all in editing, <laughs> as, know, as we're learning about today. I know, but I, I try not to cheat. So, oh, I'm one of those God. guys who like does reality TV and goes, oh, "But that's not really what happened." <laughs> so, so, Lee, what was it you were saying? You know, speaking of things happening over and over and over again, it's at that time to thank our sponsors. <laughs> it is, and today our sponsors are Scarecrow Video and the Grand Illusion Theater. Scarecrow Video is one of the largest independent video stores in the country and located in Seattle's beautiful University District. One of the last remaining brick and mortar stores featuring DVDs, VHS, Laserdisc, and even Blu ray. It's wow. a mecca, people. Yeah. If you can't find a movie in Scarecrow, it's simply because it hasn't been filmed yet. For more info, visit scarecrowvideo.com. And the Grand Illusion Theater, also located in Seattle's beautiful University District, located. Blah, 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 blah. I'm not sure where is it. Who writes this crap? Is it across from the Jack in the Box in an old dental office? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've heard that before. <laughs> where has anybody seen the Grand Illusion Theater? <laughs> yeah. Where is it? Oh, it's across from um, the Jack in the Box in the U District. Did you guys know that it's also uh, Seattle's classiest, weirdest, and completely volunteer-operated cinema? It screens the world's finest art house, foreign, and revival films. If you want to find out what's playing there this week, you should go to Grand Illusion. Cinema.org. That awesome. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. So next up, 
It's World War II drama Schindler's List. In Poland during World War II, Oskar Schindler gradually becomes concerned for his Jewish workforce after witnessing their persecution by the Nazis. The movie was edited by Michael Kahn. So, I think, Lee, you've mentioned once or twice that this movie's three hours long. Oh, God, it's so long. <laughs> it's very long. It's great, but it's long. It could have been, re- it could have been just as great two and a half hours. I, I will not fault uh, the quibbles with the, the length. I definitely think the length probably could be shortened. Um, uh, but then we would lose a great Seinfeld episode. <laughs> <laughs> they still could have made out during Schindler's List, even if it was two hours. Um, I will say this. I, I just watched it recently. It doesn't feel like a three-hour movie to me. No. It, 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 it actually goes by, I find it to go by very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think when the stakes are high... You know, you're you're when you're engaged, it and and it, you know, the 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 scene. Uh, there's so many scenes to choose from, and and you know, from a, I mean, I think I think um, you know, one of the things, uh, sort of a an editing thing, and that's a, a post thing that that uh, probably everyone. I mean, everyone. The probably the first thing off their mouth is, um, you know, the girl in the little, little red coat. Mm-hmm. You know, that's all. That's all a color correcting thing, and it's and it's a great. It's a great scene for. Um, focusing uh, us on uh, Oscar Schindler, uh, Liam Neeson's sort of radicalization. You know, him watching this this ghetto being liquidated, and um, and him watching her. It, it just orients us to to what he is thinking about, and that and and having that red coat and that beautiful black and white um, is such a fantastic thing. And all done in post. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> No. But um, <laughs> but but the scene, you know, there's so many scenes I could talk about. But uh, a scene that I love is in when when uh, Oscar Schindler is pulling uh, Itzhak Stern off the train, mm-hmm. and uh, he comes down to the train, and um, and and Itzhak Stern has been rounded up and is is being set off um, uh, to one of the the, the camps, and um, and he comes up to some some officers. And uh, you know he demands to see this list that that they're working off, and and he he demands to have its stern uh, pulled off the train, and and these you know very officious officers are like going, well you know we we, we can't you know the list of the list we can't pull them off, and and so with the first guy goes, what's your name? Give me your name. And he starts writing down his name, and then another officer comes up, and and um, and you know he goes, uh, you know what what's your name? And like they're not they're not cooperating with him. So he just very coolly just like going, what's your name? What's your name? And he starts writing down the things, and and uh, and then he he goes, uh, well, um, uh, thank you, gentlemen. By the end of the month, I hope you will be enjoying your time in northern Russia, being stationed in northern Russia. And so then there's this great moment where it cuts the next scene, and he continues to walk down the train, shouting out, "Itzak, Stern, Stern, Stern!" And then just coming into frame are the two officers right behind him, right. going, "Stern, Stern!" <laughs> <laughs> and it's this great—it's comedy, you know. It's, yeah. it's this great moment of comedy, and it's just perfect beat, and it's just cut perfectly. And you know, and he, he pulls Stern off, and then, you know, this is all within the space of, of two minutes. He he finds Stern and um, and he gets him off the train and and the, they're going like, oh sir, I mean they're one one you know versus the other it really doesn't matter it's just a list we're just going off a list it doesn't really matter and and they're already walking away and and uh, it's like Stern um, is apologizing profusely I I can't believe I can't I forgot my work card and you know I so apologetic but I can round it up and um, and Liam Neeson uh, says um, uh, can you imagine uh, uh, what would have happened? Uh, what would have happened to me if you if I had been five minutes late? And and it's just this great moment where you know you know it's not about the the factory. You know it's not about um, uh, it, what he's saying. It's like you know I can't lose you. And it's just this great. It's this, it's really you know it's gone from this moment of kind of you know him just coming in like almost like an action hero but an officious action hero you know and making this this thing happen and this moment of light comedy and then there's this real moment of just genuine emotion and i, I get a little choked up thinking about it, but it's just it, it just where you know and he's not even looking at him he's just continuing to walk straight ahead but you know you just know that he's just how invested he is that's interesting because this very scene was brought up oh my god for, with brian mcdonald's Five favorite scripts okay. in '93, and his take on it is that this is before Schindler has turned, and he's like, 
do you realize what damage you would have done because I would I can't replace you because mm. it, it's completely it is a, from a, he's approaching it he like that Schindler's approaching it from a selfish point of view ah uh, interesting yeah interesting yeah interesting I I would be I would be loath to to to, uh, to quibble with Brian because I have great respect for his story sense but uh, he's totally but, wrong what's that I'm just kidding <laughs> Uh, but I think that uh, I, I think that it is, um, if not the, it's the seed being planted. Right. You know, it's yeah. like setting the table, if, yeah. if nothing else, because it just it uh, it it came off to me like you know, uh, even though he's not looking at him, it it just it felt like nobody. I'm losing nobody. Right. You know. Well, there's a challenge to our listeners. Yeah. Watch Schindler's List. Go to that scene. <laughs> if you have a spare three hours, <laughs> <laughs> write to us. Tell you. Tell us who you think is is right on this. So, uh, Schindler says, "Throw down." <laughs> <laughs> Schindler says, "Dance off." <laughs> oh. So finally, uh, the last one on your list is the documentary "The War Room," which is a documentary of the Bill Clinton 1992 presidential campaign and the organization who ran it. The editors on that were uh, Chris Hedges, Erez Laufer, and D. A. Pennebaker. So, why the War Room? Well, uh, I'm obviously very biased to, to documentaries, and, and I think that documentaries are made in the editing room. And I think that uh, this is an exceptional uh, documentary because. First of all, uh, D.A. Pennebaker has such a um, a fantastic track record, um, and most of his stuff, though, was um, was more music. Like he did what was considered sort of the first music video with Bob Dylan, which we've all seen and even recreated with In Excess, and you know, with the with the the cards, oh, the and, cards you know, and Don't Look yeah. Back, yeah. yeah. And um, and then um, and then he did uh, Monterey Pop, and he's you know, he just he was the um, the music. Uh, the rock and roll documentary, and um, what is interesting about this is that this was about the generation, um, the, that generation of um, uh, from the '60s, you know, baby their first time baby boomers. Thank you, exactly to be um, to be running for president, and you know, Bill Clinton's always been joked about as being the the first um, black president, but he also has been, you know, uh, referred to as, as as the rock and roll president. Mm-hmm. Like there was, he just brought a different energy to it, and this campaign was a very very different uh, campaign than had been done before. Um, what the film is, what's interesting about it is that you barely see Bill Clinton because it's really uh, focused on James Carville and George Stephanopoulos and uh, and how they lead, you know, their team. And, you know, you catch a lot of just, you know, the, you, you see a lot of just great scenes that um, uh, I still remember to this day. But the, the one, you know, the, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff is the most fascinating. And there's a scene in there that I love that is um, James Carville uh, talking about, um, he's talking to the whole staff uh, the night before the election. And um, he's talking about how, um, golf is about luck, uh, and the more you practice, um, the luckier you get. And and how um, you know this has been, you know, the greatest thing that you can do is you know is give your love to somebody. But the second greatest thing you can do is give your labor to somebody. And so just thanking his team. But what's phenomenal about this is that it's a two minute shot that is a focus on Carville, and he's in a big room. It's just a two-minute uninterrupted shot. Now you have the option as an editor to cut away to how people are taking this in. You know, there were some, there were a couple staffers behind him that were, you know, had little tears in their eyes, and you know, they were wiping away tears. And um, you, you have the option of going to those um, those shots to kind of like bring it into like he's talking to all these people. But there was a choice made to just stay on Carvel even as he got overwhelmed with emotion and kind of stumbled a little bit and you know because when we do corporate video and stuff like we're always cleaning things up when Mm -hmm. we're doing tv we're always cleaning up the the stumbles and stuff by keeping it all on carville while he goes through this very emotional thing it made us feel like we were in the room as the campaign workers and we'd been on we were being thanked for being on this campaign in a way we were we, you know, and so it's just a, it's a really great moment. It's a powerful moment, um, and especially to see the raging Cajun have a moment of sort of <laughs> you know, moment of weakness. But yeah. I love stuff like that where you just mm-hmm. let 
it be. Let it be. And yeah. just hang yeah. on it and, you know, any sort of awkward pauses. Yeah. And um, like I'm demonstrating here. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll edit this out. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, yeah, that, that stuff where you just are like seeing somebody kind of searching for what they're trying to say. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's, it's so interesting to watch somebody like, yeah. look for the right word. Yeah. And, and uh, it's it's pretty rare that, that, that an editor will let that sit. I think my job is to make you look good. My job is to clear up your stumbles and make, right. you know, and all the stuff. And so, so, you know, the instinct is like, Oh, let, let me save him. Let me make him, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the truth is, is it's more endearing, especially in that moment right. to let him try to find those words yeah. that are really, you know, because he's trying to be, because, because then also it also shows that, you know, by covering, by if, if you cover something up or something of like, well, they may have, that may not have been like, that might've been a longer thing right you know we just saw the complete thing and you mm-hmm. know that then authenticity um you know that's that's an interesting thing sort of talking about um documentary and what's sort of a sidebar but but uh, i get clients now where say we want to make a viral video and, <laughs> and i always laugh because you know and, and and i have to explain you know viral videos um are a very different animal than a corporate video or whatever it may be that you know where they're coming from and the, the thing about viral videos is that most often they're one camera, they're not edited, mm-hmm. um, and what makes them viral is that they're, it's the authenticity. Right. You know, it's not the cut. It's not been cut, and there's not been any manipulation to mm-hmm. it. And so, um, so it's moments like that that, that would go viral, you right. know, because it feels very real. Yeah. So. Great choices. So to wrap up, 32, films, 32 short films about Glenn Gould, Fearless. Groundhog Day, Schindler's List, and The War Room. Yes. All right. Well, check those, check those out. If you like what you heard today, those are Tracy's choices to go check out. Uh, thanks again for coming down. And, Absolutely. And, my pleasure. And Enjoyed spending it. a couple hours with us and uh, getting this out there. Uh, and again, if people want to follow you on Twitter, you are available at? Uh, Traced Editor, which is uh, T-R-A-C-E-D-I-T-O-R. Uh, once again, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Scarecrow Video and Grand Illusion Cinema. If you're a movie lover and would like to support us, you can subscribe to the 2020 Film Club. Your annual subscription gets you into 10 of our monthly four-year consideration screenings here in Seattle and a ticket to our annual ceremony in February. It's over $100 value for only $40. That's and roll. crazy. I know, it's crazy. You know what? It makes a really great gift. It does make a good it gift. It does. Mm-hmm. Mom, I think I know what I'm getting you for Christmas. Oh, lovely idea. <laughs> think ahead. To enroll, just visit us at 2020awards.org and look for the subscriber link. And until next time, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past. <laughs>